My name is Elia Scheer. I'm the Director of Alumni Engagement at the Law School. Thank you so much for being here this weekend. We're so delighted to have you and uh, even more delighted that the heavens have shown upon us with a beautiful autumnal day. So I hope you really enjoy your time here in New Haven. I want to also take a few moments to thank all of our presenters who are going to be sharing with us uh, this afternoon. We have Professor David Schleicher, uh, Emily Bazelon, and uh, a contingent of her students um, who will be speaking with us later, and also uh, Professor Doug Heiser, and um, I'll give each of them uh, their turn to come up and share with all of you. And, um, We'll be recording this as well, so it will be available uh, after the event if you want to tune back in. The idea here is these are sort of like TED Talks. They get to dive into something for about 20 minutes uh, that's very interesting, related to their work, and something that we will also find interesting. Um, there will not be uh, open Q&A as we kind of want to go one presentation into the next, but I do encourage you to reach out to these uh, presenters afterward. Some of them will be here to mingle with you as well afterward if you want to talk with them about their work and their presentations. So without further ado, I'm going to dive right in with um, Professor Slyker's uh, uh, introduction here. So he's going to be speaking to us today um, on the title, In a Bad State, What Should the Federal Government Do in a State if a State or Major City Faces a Debt Crisis? So his bio reads thusly, David N. Schleicher is a professor of law at Yale Law School and is an expert in local government law, land use, federalism, state and local finance, and urban development. His scholarship focuses on state and local elections, the relationship between local government law and agglomeration economics, and pathologies in land use politics and procedure. He has been called the most important thinker we have on the subject of local government, an ingenious by the National Review, and one of the most interesting writers on land use. I, I kind of wonder how long that list is though, David. <laughs> Uh, by Washington Monthly. His work has been described as great but old-fashioned by Vox. He put that th in here himself, I will tell you. He wrote this. Uh, at interesting by the nation, clever by the economist, neat by Slate, uh, prescient by City Observatory, excellent by Forbes, and discussed extensively in the New York Times, The Atlantic, National Affairs, Reuters, and a number of other places. He is also the host of the hit podcast, Digging a Hole, the Legal Theory Podcast, which I actually subscribe to myself. You might not know that. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to invite you up, Professor, please. Thanks. Thanks so much for coming. Am I, am I good? Um, uh, and yes, and by the way, and, and I really do encourage anyone to email me or reach out to me uh, later. Um, so I want you to imagine something with me. Um, five, 10 years on, um, people in Washington are doing what they're doing, and a, um, a, a newsflash hits. The governor of Illinois and the mayor of the city of Chicago are holding a press conference, and they are announcing that they are not going to be able to pay their debt. They're going to default on their bonds and on their pension obligations unless Washington does something. Um, the newscasts go crazy. Uh, they, they, they pan to the streets of Chicago where there's a mass general strike of government employees who refuse to or go, who are refusing to work on because of future pension, uh, pension cuts. Uh, um, uh, Fortune 500 companies fearing huge tax increases start in, that are located in Chicago um, uh, start announcing their plans to move elsewhere. The president goes, God, what am I going to do? Brings together a set of advisors. To, and congressional allies to talk about what to do, and gets in the meeting, and the council, the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors says, "Ms. President, uh, whatever we do, we can't rely on austerity. Uh, we're in a one of the reasons this default is happening is because of a recession, and if we just cut, raise taxes and cut spending, and they do, it will cause mass economic harms and social harms, class sizes of 40 or 50 students per class, crime everywhere, disaster." cannot rely on austerity to solve this problem. The, a senator from another state interjects and says, hold on there. 
I don't know that I can ask my ask my constituents to help pay for the problems of Illinois or Chicago. They've been spending beyond their means for uh, as long as I can remember. Um, further, if we do help them out, it's going to lead to every governor and every mayor knowing that there is uh, no cost to fiscal profligacy. Secretary of the Treasury says, okay, okay, but whatever happens, they can't actually default on their debt. State and local governments build everything that you can actually touch that a government builds, all roads, all school buildings, water infrastructure, almost everything that actually you can touch is built by, if we care about infrastructure and the future of the economy, we uh, need government, state and local governments to build things. If go a government the size of Illinois defaults, uh, they won't be able to borrow, the municipal bond market will seize up. No more construction of anything. Our infrastructural plans are ruined. What should the president do? This may sound a little fanciful. I mean, not happy fanciful, but you know. Um, uh, but if you recall, only a couple of years ago, this seemed like a real likelihood. At the beginning of the pandemic, every fiscal analyst worth their salt was predicting huge numbers of state and local, or particularly local, defaults. Um, the head of the state senate of Illinois went to Congress, at least reportedly, and asked for a giant Illinois-specific bailout. Um, this wave of defaults didn't happen. It didn't happen for a variety of reasons. One, you know, high-end incomes that, uh, that drive state tax returns didn't fall by as much as people expected. It didn't happen because of federal support for the broader economy, which meant that incomes generally didn't fall by as much as people expected, and therefore taxes didn't fall, property values didn't fall. Um, and because the federal government gave, um, honestly, a boatload of cash far lar to states and cities far larger than the fiscal hole that emerged um, as a result of the uh, pandemic. Right now, states and cities are in fiscally pretty good shape. And this gives us an opportunity to think about what we're going to do the next time this happens. Are the solutions we came up with in 2020 good ones? How should we think about this problem now in this kind of period of calm? Because state and local fiscal crises are an inevitability in a country with 50 states, t tens of thousands of local governments, and, um, uh, and a business cycle. What should we do? And if you recall this debate at all, it was the kind of at the periods during 2020 and 2021, we were all worried about some other things, you know, but was the kind of white hot center of American politics. Um, the Republican Democrats had, Republicans kept talking about blue state bailouts as if, Republic, if red, led, red states didn't also have fiscal problems caused by the pandemic. Democrats talked about uh, Republican proposals for state bankruptcy um, uh, in kind of catastrophic terms as if we didn't have a municipal bankruptcy system that works somewhat similarly, uh, quite similarly, and as if sovereign bankruptcy at the national level hadn't been a long-run goal of some progressives. This d kind of st stale debate is uh, easy to blame, like politicians are dumb, they don't know what they're talking about, they're having stupid debates about, I don't know, whatever. And I enjoy doing that as much as anybody else does. Who doesn't enjoy do that? Um, but I think actually a lot of the blame for the failure of uh, the kind of the problem, the kind of lack of clarity in this debate or lack of the idea that kind of the issue is joined um, was driven not by politicians or by anything, but by scholars who have not developed a clear, or thinkers, or I don't know how you want to think about it, um, uh, but uh, who have not developed a clear enough theory of what is actually at issue when a state or, state or local government faces a giant debt crisis. What is the problem? What are the constraints? What are the trade-offs? Um, to the extent the literature, and there's a pretty substantial literature on this subject, because the issue goes back as far as the first Congress, um, there are two basic narratives that we've told about this issue. One, you can see uh, Jonathan Rodden, the political science, Bob Inman, the economist, um, argue that bailouts, uh, that is to say, instances like when Alexander Hamilton proposed um, to assume state debts, a bailing out of state and local budget, um, are a problem. And the reason is that they create what po people call moral hazard or soft budget constraints, that uh, politicians will understand that uh, there, are no con there are no consequences for, uh, for, um, for spending too much money because they will get bailed out by the federal government and the result will be profligate. Relatedly, bond markets or lenders won't punish them. They don't, won't care whether they're you know, spending too much or not spending too much because, well, the federal government is actually standing behind it. Um, that uh, 
the court under this idea bail out to the problem. And the great success story in American political life of this story is the uh, re kind of rejection of Hamiltonian ideas about assumption of state debts that happen in uh, kind of this kind of well-known moment in eight, the 1840s where the federal government lets eight states in the territory default, um, rejecting Hamiltonian ideas and so they default, we'll deal with it later. Um, the other idea is that bailouts are great, they're necessary. And this idea says state and local spending is famously, I think it's famously, like a Taylor Swift album just came out. That's famous. This is, I don't know, something some people talk about. Um, uh, says that uh, state spending is pro-cyclical. That state budgets, because state budgets have to be balanced for legal and practical reasons, um, that state uh, that states in uh, when there's an economic recession have to raise taxes and cut spending that this is bad for the economy for ordinary Keynesian reasons and so when the economy gets bad which is when we have fiscal crises um, the federal government should step in to preserve the macro economy and one of the most effective ways to do uh, preserving the macro economy will be giving aid to states and the dynamics of this you can kind of understand, but it turns out if you look across American history, and we've had a huge number of state and city fiscal crises the federal government has intervened in. This issue is only one of issue because most, more, most frequently the federal government didn't even have the capacity to offer bailouts and certainly didn't want to. And the thing that this literature misses and that actually kind of helps understand what's going on in these crises is that um, the question of if a government is going to face fiscal crisis on its own without bailout, what happens then? Who should bear the cost? Is a separate policy question. That is to say, should creditors bear the cost? That's the people who've lent money. Should the government default on its debts? Um, states are protected by sovereign immunity, something we'll come back to in a second. Um, or alternately, should we for enforce these contracts vigorously, overcoming certain limitations on the, the legal protections and their methods through which we can do that, uh, and make taxpayers pay the cost. Um, and this question has driven huge numbers of political disputes. So we, you might know, to the extent you've thought about this at all, it's the, the bailout question has probably been central in your thinking. So again, you can think about the uh, cabinet battle won in Hamilton, which is about a bailout. Um, but the question about what to do about the railroad bond crisis was probably not something you, in the 1870s, which is probably not something you spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, but this question of uh, allocating the cost has been as central to our debates and ours is central today to debates say like what, what to do, what we should have done about Detroit, um, in, as has the question of bailout and non-bailout. Further, the literature, one of the reasons, maybe the reason the literature has missed this question is because it's not written by lawyers for the most part. Lawyers, uh, we, um, for this work, don't offer a course, it used to be the case, but don't offer classes on uh, state and local debt anymore. Um, I don't know if we did when you were here, but probably not actually. Um, neither does any other law school. Um, but the basic idea of the enforceability of contracts, so who should bear the cost, the taxpayer, the bondholder, is thought to be kind of a wooden issue. Whereas, in fact, there have been huge amounts of policy decision making in this area, mostly done by courts. And in fact, if you remember taking Fed courts as a class, the actual content of Fed courts, a huge amount of it is actually driven by these questions. So you might have remembered sovereign immunity as a case here. What, sorry, sorry, Hans versus Louisiana. What is that about? That case is about um, uh, the extent to which southern states, all of which defaulted at the end of Reconstruction, should be able to get out from the obligations created by uh, mixed race reconstruction governments. And the Supreme Court creates sovereign immunity, has some legal interpretive tools and whether it's right or not is not my question here, but rather it was designed in large part to absolve southern states of the obligations created by mix, for mixed race governments. At the same time, the government is, the Supreme Court, is acting to make policy. And again, in a very free form, Lochnery, in fact, people, uh, so there are a number of scholars who say that uh, the Lochner era court was drawing directly on the, pop, the thinking of these courts um, uh, to enforce bond contracts against huge numbers of cities all throughout the Midwest, and actually all throughout the whole country, enforcing railroad bonds, which were efforts by local governments to subsidize railroads. Um, and in so doing, when you, uh, if you remember Swift versus Tyson, God, I'm, only a few, I've seen a few nods. Well, the actual doctrine of Swift versus Tyson was all about this. 
you read about something else, but the actual application of it and the kind of creation of it as thing was all about this question. So, what is the issue that, what makes this a hard issue to deal with is that there are three things the federal government wants to do and it can't achieve all three of them. There's no way to do it. So when a state or city is in facing fiscal crisis, the federal government has three basic goals and always has and always faces the same type of issues. And the first one is that it doesn't want to make recessions worse. Almost all state fiscal crises happen when the economy is bad. When the economy is good, it's not that hard to pay your debts. You figure out some other way to do it. Um, and if you uh, force a government to pay its debts or government, you, don't, you don't help it in any way, the thing it has to do, given that it can't print money, is raise taxes and cut spending. And this makes the economy much, much worse. It also creates social problems um, because these things are happening in bad times and we rely on states and cities and always have to um, provide a lot of our social safety net. Second thing they want to do is they want to avoid moral hazard. This is a real problem that if where the federal government does bailouts, state and local governments understand the score, and particularly bond markets understand the score, and will respond to the incentives created by the government. Uh, a, a huge number of international financial crises in the 1990s were created by bailouts to states and cities in Argentina and Brazil, and a couple other places too. But the, the Argentina would bail out states and cities, and then the next, like two minutes later, they would take out a lot more money. And you know, it was a, a series of cascading disasters. Um, the last thing is that we want states and cities to borrow. If we were really concerned about those two things only, we would not care whether states and cities borrow money. But we have an active federal policy encouraging states and cities to borrow money. And the reason we do so is because they're the only ones who build anything. There are reason, there are kind of political science theories about why that's the case, and I can talk about it if you're interested. But in practice, we subsidize state and local government borrowing quite a lot. That uh, if any of you own municipal bonds, the one thing you know about them is you don't pay income tax on them. And that is a federal subsidy of state and local borrowing. The reason we do this is we want them to build stuff. We need stuff. Governments need stuff, and the federal government just doesn't do it. Never has. Only a few moments. There have only been a few moments in American history where the federal government has come close to providing a majority of the spending on a category of infrastructure at the height of the, uh, the, in the high highway system. But if you think about most roads you drive on, they weren't built by the federal government. certainly if you count maintenance and operation. So when a state and city faces a fiscal crisis, the federal government has three options, but they don't, can't achieve all three of those things. So if they provide a bailout, as Hamilton did, and as arguably the federal government did 45 seconds ago, or 2021, um, this will help economic activity. In fact, it's done such a good job of helping economic activity in 2021 that it's driven inflation. It will also help the bond market, that is to say, people will be more than willing to lend money to states and cities to build things if they know the federal government with its vast taxing power and ability to spend is, um, uh, is, uh, is um, standing behind it. But it will create moral hazard. And we have all these amazing instances in American history of exactly this happening. So after Hamilton's, uh, Hamilton's uh, assumption of state debts, the federal government, uh, the lending increased all throughout the world because everyone understood that investing in state infrastructure would be a good deal. Um, if the federal government wants to uh, um, encourage default, that is to say, you know, then this will avoid, um, avoid moral hazard and reduce some of the Keynesian harm, but it will stop, people will stop investing in states and cities. And we see this, again, we've had many defaults over time, and in fact, in practice, it has led to people not, um, not investing in infrastructure or levels of government not investing in infrastructure. And if we force austerity, well, it creates problems. It will help the bond market and uh, avoid moral hazard, but it will harm the economy. You can go through American history and go, th we've cycled through these solutions over time, and I can kind of go through each one of these, but I don't have a ton of time here. Um, and huge amounts of what we should understand about America have been driven by these stories. So, for instance, the, again, the railroad bond crisis, for, there were pro-bondholder, and this was really bad for the economy, but it led to the existence of the ability to borrow that led to all the infrastructure that you know and love. Brooklyn Bridge, reversing of the Chicago River. Efforts to allow default. So we made up sovereign immunity doctrine in the 1880s in order to help southern states default on their debt, and this helped their economies in the short run, but led to their inability to borrow. If you want to know why southern states are poor, 
or were much poorer. This is not the only reason. There's obviously a lot of reasons, but this is one of the reasons. Let me go through. Anyone want to talk about New York bankruptcy? I'm more than happy to talk about that endlessly. Um, so, what, so, I, so what lessons can we take from this going forward? Well, the first lesson is that there are no good answers here. It's a sad story no matter what way you do it. And one of the things that's so difficult about watching politics kind of debate these questions is that there's not a clear acknowledgement of the fact that once a state or city is in fiscal trouble, the federal government has nothing but bad choices. However, there are things they can do to make it a little less bad. And the missed opportunities of the last couple of years highlight failures to make things a little less bad. There are a few efforts here and there, but for the most part we're done. And so what, is it, what can they do? Well, one thing they can do, the central way to solve that, no, I, that's the line in the book. I said that um, anyone remembers the movie War Games? Because it's a funny game. The only way to win is not to play. A few fans, a few Matthew Broderick fans there in the back. No, it's good. Um, well, one thing you could do is change federal policy across a huge number of dimensions to encourage states to be more, um, uh, more uh, fiscally prudent. So you could make the interest exemption on municipal bonds conditional on adopting better accounting standards. You could change federal securities laws, which largely exempt municipal bonds um, to uh, kind of encourage more bond vigilantism. Um, you could punish certain types of financial engineering that have gotten states into all kinds of trouble. You could also go for strategies that balance costs. So one of the things we've learned over time is that while you can't solve all three of these problems of the trilemma, and I had all the way back, what you can do is balance them. You can have a little of each. And so for instance, in the Detroit bankruptcy, a bailout of sorts was offered not by the federal government, but by the state government and by private entities. But they waited until after bankruptcy had been filed such that creditors were able to take a hit and weren't able to suck up all the money that was offered in the bailout. Similarly, we could understand that bankruptcy as a regime is a mechanism for balancing these costs. So um, we might extend bankruptcy to state governments. Oh, I'll skip this last one here. <laughs> um, uh, another, this is related to that you could spread costs among many local governments. Uh, we have many governments and that we often concentrate the harms in one government rather than another. So take Detroit. Um, in, when Detroit went bankrupt, the Detroit school system, which has the exact same boundaries, um, was completely saved, it was bailed out by the state government. Uh, this meant that police officers and firefighters' pensions took hits, but teachers didn't. And this is too big a cost. It would be easier, a little better if we spread the cost out across everything. And the last thing we can do, well, maybe the second to last thing we can do, is uh, invest in resilience. And what does this mean? Well, one of the things that makes fit state and local fiscal crises so painful is that um, they, uh, uh, we don't have mechanisms for them to spread. Okay, I'll, I'll stop right here. Um, the solution to this, well, there's no solution to the problem of state and local budget crisis. Yeah, I offered to say, what should we do? And the answer is, shrug your face emoticon. That may not be the most satisfying story to tell, but thinking about the ways we can use whatever response we make in order to cushion the next thing, to make the next crisis less bad is the way towards wisdom. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do you want to share quickly um, how folks could contact you if they uh, want? My email is available. It's on the website. I can't find it anyway. Spelling my last name will be a disaster. <laughs> thank you very much for sharing with us today, Professor. Up next, we have Emily Bazelon, who is a graduate of the class of 2000, and she is a lecturer in law, senior research scholar in law, and a Truman Capote fellow here at the law school. Um, she's gonna be talking to us today about the prison letters project that she has been working on, uh, together with three of her students, Natalie Smith from the class of 23, Partha Sharma from the class of 23 as well, and Jonathan Terry, also from the class of 23, so some bright minds in that class. And I'll just say a few words about Emily's background. So Emily Bazelon is a lecturer in law, senior research scholar. We just talked about all of these things. She is also a staff writer at the New York Times Magazine and author of two national bestsellers, Charge, The Movement to Transform American Prosecution and End Mass Incarceration, 
and sticks and stones defending the culture of bullying and rediscovering or defeating and not defending i'm sorry defeating the culture of bullying and rediscovering the power of character and empathy she co-hosts a popular podcast the slate political gab fest and before joining the times baslon worked for nine years as a senior editor at slate and she has been a Soros Media Fellow, an editor and writer at Legal Affairs Magazine, and a law clerk on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth or the First Circuit. She was a frequent guest on the Colbert Report, and uh, Bazelon is also a graduate of Yale College as well as the law school. So, Emily, please come on up, and uh, your students uh, can join you as well, and they will introduce themselves throughout the presentation. Oh, you got it. Excellent. Um, hi, it's such a pleasure to be here with all of you this afternoon to tell you about the Prison Letters Project, a project that I've been working on with these fabulous students up here who will tell you a little bit more about themselves when it's their turn to talk. The genesis of this project is a letter that I received from Utico Briley in April 2019. He wrote to me from his prison cell in Louisiana after he heard me talking on the radio about my book, Charged, which is about the power of prosecutors. And the letter Utico wrote to me made two claims. He said that he was innocent, and then he told me that he was serving a more than 60-year sentence without parole for an armed robbery in which no one was injured. So when I first read this letter, I didn't know what to make of Utico's innocence claim, but the punishment seemed so excessive that I just felt obligated to learn more. So I looked up his case. Um, there were some appeals courts decisions online. And what I learned was that um, Utico was arrested about 24 hours after this armed robbery took place in New Orleans. So he wasn't picked up at the scene. And he was identified by a single eyewitness, the victim of the robbery, who identified him even though the robbery took place very quickly in the middle of the night. And I also learned that this was a cross-racial identification. Uh, the victim was white, Utica was black. I knew from being at the law school and my previous journalism that this is the kind of eyewitness identification that can be really shaky. And there was no other direct or physical evidence linking Utico to this armed robbery. So I decided to do something I'd never done before as a journalist. I decided to look for a lawyer for Utico. It seemed like he needed a lawyer and legal help more than he needed me. The person I eventually recruited, um, because this case had exhausted its appeals, was my sister, Lara Baslon, who runs a criminal defense clinic at the University of San Francisco. And we kind of embarked on this joint odyssey of investigating Utico's case over the next couple of years. The voters of New Orleans um, gave Utico his big break when they elected a new district attorney and a new judge. And in 2021, he was exonerated of this armed robbery, and he is living his life in Baton Rouge. So this letter that Utico wrote to me really proved to be his bid in fighting for freedom. But I am and was haunted by the fact that I almost didn't read it at all. When it arrived, it got buried in a big pile of mail at the New York Times. And the only reason that I saw it was Utico had a pen pal who told me over email to go look for this letter. She was a librarian in Oregon who had been writing to Utico for a few years. In talking to other journalists and criminal defense lawyers and law professors, I learned, and I, I knew this, that this is a guilty reality for a lot of us. We got a, get a lot of mail from incarcerated people, and it often goes unopened or unresponded to. And because this letter had such a profound impact on Utico's life and on my life, I wanted to try to do better. So I talked to Dwayne Betts about this issue. Dwayne is presenting down the hall. He started this wonderful project called Freedom Reads, which builds uh, libraries in prison. And we shared a conviction that if people could hear the stories we hear in these letters, that it just might be a way to bring more resources toward um, helping incarcerated people. 
Um, and so the goal of this prison letters project is for us to respond to these letters and, and to use them with the permission of the writers to try to amplify the stories in them, the injustices that they may reveal. Um, so I'm going to turn this presentation over to Jonathan to tell you about the public database we've created and the newsletter that we write with the New York Times Magazine to try to shine a light on some of the stories in the letters that we continue to receive. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan Terry, and I'm a 3L working on the Prison Letters Project. You got it. better? Um, and I was inspired to join this work because prior to law school, I worked with prosecutors to help inform them of some of the effects of their decision making, uh, which often disproportionately affects communities of color and poor communities. And a lot of my work involved teaching in prisons. And so I would go into prisons and uh, often take prosecutors there. And I met so many people who really wanted to be taken seriously, who wanted their stories to be heard and their claims uh, to maybe reach someone who could help them. And so the, the goal of the Prison Letters Project is to help amplify some of those voices and to connect people with advocates, whether they be lawyers or journalists or even just pen pals who might lend an ear or possibly some extra resources. To build the database, we have worked with Freedom Reads, which is the brainchild of uh, Reginald Dwayne Betts, as Emily mentioned. Uh, and the goal of Freedom Reads is to help empower people through literature and the telling of stories. And so we've built a home on the Freedom Reads website where we can list some of the uh, anonymized stories of the people who write to us. And so we include some facts about their case, their legal claims, and occasionally a quote or two to help humanize the writers who are uh, corresponding with us. Our New York Times uh, newsletter is meant to dive a little bit deeper into some of those stories and to talk about some of the issues that come up again and again when you're corresponding with folks who are on the inside. And so our first New York Times newsletter focused on Tim Young's case. Uh, Tim was, uh, maintains his innocence after being convicted of homicide, um, imprisoned for 23 years, and sentenced to death in California. And although some new facts have come to light in Tim's case, he doesn't have the resources to help find an attorney who can help incorporate those into an appeal. And as you might have noticed, Tim's name hasn't been anonymized, and that's because he's one of a handful of correspondents with us who has his own personal campaign to get some news out about his story and to talk about some of the injustices that he's faced. We hope that as the newsletter becomes more and more popular that we would gain more attention and more uh, contacts from some uh, advocates possibly like yourselves who could lend an ear or possibly uh, legal representation or other help for these folks. Uh, and to talk a little bit about how a letter gets to us and then ends up in the database, uh, I'll hand it off to my classmate Partha. Hi, I'm Partha Sharma. I'm also a third year at the law school. And before law school, I worked at a firm in New York that handles post-conviction criminal litigation and lawsuits brought by exonerees seeking, wrongful, seeking damages for the wrongful convictions. Uh, as part of my work there, I was involved in dealing with requests for pro bono assistance from prisoners throughout New York State. And I became aware of just how many individuals have potentially meritorious claims of wrongful conviction or excessive sentencing, um, but for whom it's nearly impossible to gain representation to effectively present those case claims to a court. Uh, and that motivated me to become part of this project during law school. So I'm going to offer a little bit of context about the process through which we communicate with those who write to us. Uh, when we read letters, um, we take stock of the letter writer's situation and the claims that they present to us. After that, uh, we usually write a letter back to them explaining the process, uh, explaining our project, and sending a form that asks for additional information. The form asks them to explain their claims in, in greater detail, um, asks them if they have an attorney currently representing them, um, if they have someone on the outside that we could communicate with or that they'd like us to be in touch with, um, and ask about the status of any pending post-conviction proceedings. If they do have an attorney representing them, we make sure that we reach out to the attorney before we publish any information about them online. The information we receive through the form uh, is very helpful in case any advocates reach out wanting to offer help, or in case someone just reaches out wanting to be a pen pal in communication with one of our letter writers. Uh, that we, in our communications with them, we want to make sure that we're quite forthright about what we can do and what we can't do. Um, as much as we might want to, we can't offer legal advice, uh, and, we make, and it's important that we make that clear to them. On our website, we've created a database uh, that uh, includes quotations from those who write to us, as well as 
if you click on these individual links, uh, information about their claims. Uh, as was previously alluded to, we've um, only identified people by their initials on the database. And I'm going to hand it over to Natalie, who's going to talk a bit more about the individuals who write to us and their stories. Hi, my name's Natalie. I'm currently a 3L, and I came to law school after spending five years conducting sociological interviews with folks in carceral and community settings around the Northeastern United States. To me, the most meaningful part of this project is to build a platform that facilitates communication across the prison walls and is a way of channeling resources inside. Um, although it remains to be seen if the project is successful in helping writers to get actual legal relief, I believe that, at the least, taking people's claims seriously is meaningful to many of the people that write us. For example, DM, a man incarcerated in Texas, wrote to us that he was wrongfully convicted of two counts of attempted capital murder after police executing a no-knock warrant, heard a pop sound, and recovered a bullet from his porch. And DM is actually, if you switch to the next one, these are some portraits folks sent us from inside um, to be featured on the database and in newsletters. DM is actually the person on the far side. Um, so DM's story was one of the first ones that we included in our database, and he's quoted in the first New York Times Magazine newsletter. Although he's yet to be connected with an advocate who might support him directly, when we wrote to tell him that he was featured, DM responded that being featured in the newsletter was, quote, all the hope I had of someone seeing my story and through the grace of God and across the country to hear my true story and potentially offer assistance. With no family down here in Texas and in prison alone, the newsletter is all I had. It made me feel like I had some hope, unquote. Beyond correspondence with writers on their individual claims, the Prison Letters Project also collaborates with incarcerated journalist John J. Lennon. This is John there, who we wish could be here now, but alas, is currently incarcerated. So because communication lines to people in prison are so restricted, the logistics of our partnership have often been very complex. Sometimes we correspond through JPay, which is an expensive email platform that's available to folks in some prisons. Other times, we relay phone messages through his assistant, who he works with on the outside. Other times, John will give us an unexpected call, sometimes late at night or on the weekends. John brings invaluable experience, and it's been exciting to collaborate with a seasoned journalist who works on the inside. Some of the people who have written us have also expressed interest in building their skills as prison journalists, and we're beginning to contemplate ways to help folks build their own skills and publicize their writings. Now I'll pass back to Emily to wrap up. Thank you. So if John uh, J. Lennon were here, he would want us to emphasize that we are just as interested in stories about excessive punishment and prison conditions as we are in stories of innocence. Um, John himself and many of the people he's close with in prison have reckoned with their own guilt for, for their crimes, and so we're also interested in highlighting that kind of story and case um, in upcoming newsletters. I also want to mention Kayla Vinson, who's the executive director of the new Center for Law and Racial Justice at the law school. She has joined our team as the real practicing attorney. The students are going to be excellent practicing attorneys, but in the meantime, it's really helpful for us to have her as a sounding board. And in terms of our calls to action, we've been gratified so far by people reaching out to us who want to become pen pals. Um, that's a really amazing thing that almost anyone can do um, to help people who are incarcerated. And so we're connecting those folks to organizations that run pen pal trainings and services. And we've also gotten some interesting um, nibbles from lawyers. The Manhattan District Attorney's Office got in touch with us about one of our cases. Um, we're hoping they may reinvestigate it. And individual lawyers have asked us about volunteering to represent people who write to us, um, including somebody from the ACLU. Our dream would be for a law firm or some other organization to come in and really help us fill this gap in representation. 
even though I think um, what we're doing is important uh, for responding to people and adds a lot of dignity, we hope, there is a huge gap even between the more sort of um, thought through process we've set up and actually investigating a case and representing someone. Um, and so that is the sort of big um, gap that we would still love more help um, filling. We are very clear with people when they write to us and in presenting the project that we don't know exactly where it's going to go. But one thing that's been really clear to me and very moving is to watch the students communicating back and forth with um, incarcerated people. You can tell from the quote that Natalie read that that kind of taking people seriously, giving them someone on the outside, um, a smart, thoughtful, kind law student to be in touch with, that can be really meaningful in itself. Um, so I think I'll end there on that note, and we'll try to stick around if people have questions afterwards. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you so much. A fascinating project and one of the many amazing things that's going on here at the law school today. Our last presenter for this afternoon is Professor Douglas Kaiser. He's the Joseph M. Field uh, Professor of Law here. And he's going to share a talk with us entitled 15 Things to Know About Climate Change. And he um, is the co-director of the Law, Ethics, and Animals program here at the law school. His teaching and research areas include torts, animal law, environmental law, climate change, products liability, and risk regulation. Kaiser was previously at, uh, on the faculty at Cornell Law School, and he received uh, his BA summa cum laude from Indiana University in 1995, and his JD magna cum laude from Harvard Law School in 1998. Following law school, he clerked for the Honorable William G. Young of the United States District Court for the District of Massachusetts, and we're honored to have him with us today. Please, Professor. Thanks, everyone. I'm really delighted to have this chance to speak with you about a subject that I've been um, fretting over, studying, and teaching about for over 20 years now. Um, it's difficult to, to sort of communicate about climate change in 20 minutes, given that it's one of the most challenging and certainly one of the most gravest issues facing humanity. Um, so instead of trying to give you a comprehensive overview, what I'm going to try to do is give you 15 things I'd love for you to take away, starting with uh, the first thing, which is that scientists have actually known about this problem for a very long time. Um, at least since the middle of the 19th century. In fact, one of the earliest experimental demonstrations of the climate change phenomenon of the greenhouse effect was conducted by a scientist, an inventor, and a women's rights advocate named Dr. Eunice Foote, who lived in Seneca Falls. She conducted an experiment. The paper publishing it was read at the annual meeting of the American Advance Association for the Advancement of Sciences the paper was read by a male colleague from the Smithsonian, and historians speculate it's because she wasn't allowed to read it herself. But what she did in her ingenious experiment was to create miniature atmospheres in sealed glass jars and expose them to sunlight and then measure the temperature. And what she found was the greenhouse gas effect. And she even understood how it applies to the Earth's atmosphere. The second thing I'd like you to know is that our government has been aware of this problem for a very long time. One of the earliest high-level government reports came from the National Academies in 1962 and quite clearly outlined the greenhouse gas effect, its connection to fossil fuels, the likely impact it would have on temperatures, and how those temperature changes would in turn lead to harmful ecological consequences. There was even the recommendation in 1962 of maximizing our utilization of clean energy sources, particularly solar. In 1963, the Senate held a Clean Air Act committee hearing in which, again, the basic parameters of climate change as a scientific and a human problem were quite clearly outlined and understood. 
1965, Lyndon Johnson, in the State of the Union Address, emphasized the steady increase in carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels as a grave environmental issue. That's 1965. That same year, a high-level panel reported to the president in depth on carbon dioxide as what they called the invisible pollutant, emphasized that doing this geologically almost unthinkable thing of returning to the atmosphere 500 million years worth of condensed solar energy in the span of a few short centuries was a planetary level experiment with potentially disastrous consequences leading to marked climatic change. This is 1965. The report predicts that by the year 2000, if we don't change our emissions rates, there'll be roughly a quarter more CO2 concentrated in the atmosphere than there was in 1965. They stressed that that would lead to a situation where not local, not national, but global efforts to respond would be necessary. And in fact, that we might be forced to resort to altering other planetary level systems in order to respond to the impacts of climate change, i.e. geoengineering. This prediction from 1965, this is exactly the state we are in today. So the third thing I want you to know is that during those last 50 years, we've done essentially nothing to address this problem. So from 1965 to the year 2000, when the report predicted that concentrations would rise by around 25%, they were pretty much right. 1999, the year before 2000, 1999 is the year that a group of NGOs first filed a petition to the Environmental Protection Agency demanding that the agency regulate greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act. That was 1999. Of course, the summer of 2022 is the year that the Supreme Court struck down the Clean Power Plan, which was the EPA's effort under the President Obama administration to respond to the 2007 Supreme Court case of Massachusetts versus EPA, which said the agency had to regulate under the Clean Air Act. 1999 to 2022, again, we still don't have a regulation. The next thing I'd like you to know is that the scale of this experiment that we're running is geologically unprecedented. So this is a chart showing fluctuations in CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere over the last roughly 800,000 years, which of course is the time in which Homo sapiens emerged as a distinct species. And as you see, it's quite a stable fluctuation over that nearly one million year period until the Industrial Revolution. And then we see a change that is unprecedented in the record. I'd also like you to know that it's unequivocal that the increase in concentrations is causing an increase in the average surface temperature of the planet. And in fact, the World Meteorolog Meteorological Association is confident that there's a 50% likelihood we'll cross the 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature increase barrier that scientists have advised us not to cross there's a 50% chance we'll do it at least temporarily in the next five years. Why have scientists advised us not to go beyond that level? Well, in part because of all the effects that we've been all noticing with increasing salience and consequence around the world, but also in part because of tipping point scenarios. Tipping points are a variety of planetary scale processes with un predictable and often quite dramatic impacts for human well-being that scientists understand to be possible and indeed quite likely if we increase the temperatures farther than one and a half or two degrees Celsius and that would have massive implications for humans, the planet over. Things like the shutting down of ocean circulations which affect weather all over the planet. Things like the alteration of the monsoon patterns that affect everything in Southeast Asia. Scientists earlier this year conducted a literature review and began attaching temperature bands for these various tipping point scenarios, temperature bands in which we think these scenarios are going to be active and in some cases irreversible. Two of the most notable are already 
being triggered. That's the loss of the Greenland ice sheet and the loss of the ice sheet in West Antarctica. Some of these tipping point scenarios are not just of concern because of the ecological consequences that they would have, but also because they are themselves potential sources of further greenhouse gases, fueling even more climate change. So as the permafrost in Siberia thaws, it releases methane, which is an extremely potent greenhouse gas. There are frozen methate hydrates in the Arctic that are starting to thaw and could potentially become released. The Amazon is of special concern. To understand the Amazon, you need to understand that a single drop of water, as it travels the course of that river, will evaporate and precipitate up to eight times, bathing the entire ecosystem in moisture as it follows that course. With enough temperature increase, with enough deforestation from wildfires and from agricultural land expansion, the ecosystem shifts and could shift in a very quick time period. In as short as 20 to 30 years, it could all become dry savanna and in the process leave, leave literally billions of tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. To really put it in perspective, we have to look at the paleoclimate record, reconstructions of the history of the Earth's atmosphere and the corresponding surface temperature over 200 to 400 million years. When we look at this record, we realize that our current level of CO2 concentrations of about 420 parts per million, that has not been seen on the planet for at least 4 million years. 4 million years ago, ocean levels were about 50 feet higher than they are today. That's because of Greenland and the West Antarctic being faded to melting. If we continue at this emissions level until mid-century, we will have to look back to about 50 million years ago to find a comparable state of the atmosphere. 50 million years ago, there were palm trees in Alaska and crocodiles in the Arctic. If we continue for another 100 to 200 years at our current emissions level, we'll have to go back 250 million years to find a comparable state of the planet. 250 million years ago was a period known as the N Permian Great Extinction Event, when 70% of terrestrial life and 96% of marine life died. So when we look at our brief but consequential industrial existence, we find new sources of energy that do become discovered and that do alter the percentages of primary energy consumption. But unfortunately, we don't see that they displace prior technologies. We don't see that new sources lead to a reduction in the use of the earlier sources. Instead, they increase overall demand. We're still using the same amount of biomass, wood fuel, that we were before the Industrial Revolution. We're still using the same amount of coal. We've even increased coal in the last two years, post-pandemic. We have not built back better. So the only times we seem to have been able to lower greenhouse gas emissions is through disastrous social shocks, like wars or depressions or pandemics. That's not good climate change policy. The part of the world that has kind of engaged in the most concerted and longest effort to use policy to address greenhouse gas emissions has been Europe. And Europe has now successfully shifted to an energy base which is slightly more renewables than fossil fuels, 38% to 37%. And that's a Herculean achievement but it translates to only a 32% decrease in greenhouse gas emissions from the year 1990. So roughly 30% over roughly 30 years. What we actually need the world to do now is 100% decarbonization in 30 years, the entire world. The Paris Agreement was another monumental achievement and it established 
a method for global cooperation which depends on bottom-up pledges by nations pledges as to how much they're going to commit to reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the hopes that those pledges cause a spiral upward of ambition among the world's major emitting nations. It has led to an improvement over prior policies, which would have had us on this emissions trajectory. But even if we look at those pledges and assume that they're all going to be met, there's still an enormous gap a 25 to 28 gigaton per year gap between what we've pledged and where we need to be in order to be on that one and a half degree temperature target. That's our pledges, that's our promises. There's also a gap between our promises and our actions. So as governments are making these pledges, they're also making plans for new oil and gas leases for new coal-fired power plants, et cetera. And the path that's implied by those actions is much above the pledges. We're still subsidizing fossil fuels. Half a century after our president told us this was going to lead to a disaster. Now, this is largely a technical and an economic issue, but it's at root a justice issue. And the justice dimensions are so important for us to keep in mind. So China is, of course, and has been for several years now, the world's largest absolute emitter. But absolute emissions are only one way to think. It's a very Westphalian nation personhood-based way to think about climate dynamics. But behind those nations are real human beings. And if you think in terms of per capita emissions instead of absolute, then you realize that there's still great variation in who's benefiting from the immediate energy use associated with greenhouse gas emissions, particularly when you think of a nation like India, where per capita emissions remain very, very low, reflecting that country's relative uh, lower development status. If we go beyond nations even further and just think about all the individuals of the world and their relative wealth and income, it turns out that there's massive maldistribution of greenhouse gas emissions. The wealthiest 1% on the planet are responsible for 15% of emissions. The wealthiest top 10% are, are responsible for nearly half of emissions. The bottom 50% of the world's population are responsible for only 7% of emissions. There's an intergenerational dimension as well. There's a reason young people are angry. They know that my generation and your generation took more than our fair share and that they will have, as a result, fewer tons to emit over their lifetimes. There's even a gender dimension this is just starting to come out, this data, but it appears that men are more profligate emitters than women. Raise your hand if you're surprised. <laughs> the most important justice dimension, though, is historical emissions. Greenhouse gases often have long lifespans. Those, every ton of carbon that we've burned since the Industrial Revolution is still up there causing warming. There are long lifespans for many of these pollutants. And so it's a stock pollutant. And so the accumulated historical emissions that we can trace to countries or corporations or other actors, they have an intertemporal justice effect. And despite China's great increase in emissions over the last two to three decades, it's still US and Europe that's responsible for over 60% of historical emissions. And if you look at countries like Pakistan, which are now bearing the brunt of the impacts of climate change, Pakistan is responsible for a tiny, tiny percentage of historical emissions. All of Pakistan's history amounts to one year of US emissions. And of course, Pakistan found one third of its country tragically and devastatingly submerged underwater earlier this year. 
And that pattern of the, the countries that are least responsible for climate change being most directly vulnerable and impacted by the impacts of climate change, that pattern holds. Right? But I don't want any of us to think that that means that we aren't also at risk. I don't want any of us to think that climate change is just something that affects distant people in other places because the impacts that they are experiencing are just a window into the world that we are creating for everyone. So finally, I want to note that there is a movement afoot around the world, and it's really been gaining traction in just the last two to three years. And that is a movement to bring courts to bear on the climate change problem, exasperated by a half century of inaction in the political branches more and more advocates are turning to courts and asking courts to find obligations on the part of governments and corporate actors rooted in human rights principles, rooted in the rule of law. They're asking the rule of law with its dependence on reason and fact and principle to be brought into this space. And it's too early to tell what the ultimate results of those campaigns will be but I, for one, wish them well, because literally everything hangs in the balance. Thank you.